The Democratic Party is freaking out. And apparently this was happening behind the scenes, but now it is no longer behind the scenes. Thanks to this article from Politico, it has been revealed that the Democratic Party are starting to freak out, literally freak out. They're calling it a full blown freak out over Joe Biden's polling. Take a look at this fam. Dems in full blown freak out over Biden. One advisor to major Democratic donors keeps a running list of reasons Biden could lose. I hate to say I told them so, but here we are. Listen to this. A pervasive sense of fear has settled in at the highest levels of the Democratic Party over President Joe Biden's reelection prospects, even among office holders and strategists who had previously expressed confidence about the coming battle with Donald Trump. All year, Democrats have been on a joyless and exhausting grind through the 2024 election. But now, nearly five months into the election, from the election, anxiety has morphed into a palpable trepidation trepidation, according to more than a dozen party leaders and operatives. And the gap between what Democrats will say on TV or in print and what they'll text their friends has only grown as worries have surged about Biden's prospects. This is interesting too, because uh, Jill Biden, First Lady Jill Biden was recently on The View and she was reassuring everyone that Come November, the numbers will turn around in Biden's favor. So that's another example of what they're saying on TV and what they're saying behind the scenes about Biden's reelection chances. You don't want to be that guy who is on record saying we're doomed or the campaign's bad or Biden's making mistakes. Nobody wants to be that guy. That's coming from a Democratic, uh, Democratic operative. Okay. But Biden's stubbornly poor polling and the stakes of the election are creating the freak out. Everybody's just going to freak out. You know, this reminds me of, have you guys seen, um, oh, what is it? Oh, the football movie, but it's a romantic comedy. Jerry Maguire. Remember in Jerry Maguire when Tom Cruise, he just walks in, he's like, they, they told him he, he was fired or whatever. And he's gathering his stuff and he's like, good. you guys thought I was going to freak out. <laughs> Despite everything, Trump is running ahead of Biden in most battleground states. He's raised far more money in April, and the landscape may only become worse for Democrats with Trump's hush money trial concluding and another this one involving the president's son set to begin in Delaware. And as we started out the show tonight, we did tell you that you heard obviously uh, Donald Trump has been found guilty on all 34 um counts. The sentencing is supposed to be scheduled for uh, July 11th, but that doesn't mean much in reference to the election in November, because that doesn't mean that this will prevent Donald Trump from continuing his run. In fact, this could take so long. You know how long it takes for people to go to court? You know, that's why there's, you know, some people sitting in jail are sitting in jail, not necessarily because they're guilty, but because they can't pay cash bail. So they're sitting there waiting for a trial. It can take years sometimes before you actually have a trial. So that doesn't mean he's still not going to be able to participate in the presidential election. And it also shows you with that verdict that was given today, I'm already seeing people once again, turning Donald Trump into a martyr which actually could help him come November. Let's go on. The concern the concern has mesticized in recent days as Trump jaunted to some of the country's most liberal territories, including New Jersey and New York, to woo Hispanic and black voters as he boasted and probably that he would win in those areas. And let's go down to this part here. Donors ask me on an hourly basis about what I think. The advisor said, calling it so much easier to show them. So while they read it, I can pour a drink. The list of why we could win is so small. I don't even need to keep the list on my phone. See, it's all coming out, folks. It's all coming out now. 
Check this out. On the day after the news broke that Biden had trailed Trump in fundraising last month, Massachusetts Governor Maura Healey raised the pressure on donors as she introduced the president to a crowd of 300. A crowd of 300 people. But this is not new. When Biden was running for president in 2020, he came to Boston then too. It was about 100 people that showed up. I tried to tell people back then, Joe Biden never really developed a strong base. And we are starting to see this in real time now that he's up for re-election. A lot of the people that voted for him just voted for him because they didn't want Donald Trump again. That doesn't mean they loved Joe Biden. Here we are. And I wanna touch on this piece right here. Let's go down here. A Biden campaign advisor granted uh, an amenity to speak freely stressed that the president's team never made any indication that Trump's hush money trial would help or hurt him. Instead, the advisor contended that Trump will be forced to defend cutting back abortion rights, attacking democracy and advancing corporate interests as president. <sighs> it's such a mess. And this piece right here, I wanted to let you see as well. It says a lot can happen between now and then. This is coming from Representative Ann Custer. She too pointed to eroding abortion white rights under the conservative led Supreme Court remade by Trump. I know a significant number of voters are going to be motivated by the Dobbs decision. Yeah, but is that going to be enough to make Democrat operatives not panic? Apparently not. Even the media is trying to reach. You'll see here in this clip from CNN, they're trying to discuss uh, some type of unusual pattern that actually could help Biden in a certain state. Remember, Joe Biden is not doing well in the swing states. Let's get into this. So if you've been on social media in the last 10 or 15 minutes, you've seen a story is getting a huge amount of buzz right now. Politico is reporting there is a, quote, full-blown freakout among Democrats over President Biden's reelection prospects. CNN's Harry Enten is here with me now. So there's that, Harry, but there is something in the polling that's a feature that Democrats might be happy about. Yeah, you know, you, you, you spoke about, I believe, last week a little bit, and it's essentially this. Right now, we're looking at polls of registered voters. But of course, you have likely voters and those will actually turn out and vote. And if you look at the registered voters, Donald Trump's ahead by an average of two points. But look at likely voters right now. What we see in those polls, those same exact polls, but among likely voters, is a tie. And this is a very unusual pattern because normally what happens is the broader universe of all registered voters is more favorable to Democrats than those folks who actually vote. So back in 2020, Joe Biden won registered voters or led amongst them in the post-election polls by five points. He, of course, only won by four. Go back to 2012. What do we see? Among all registered voters, we saw Barack Obama would have won that group by six points, but of course he only won by four. So this is a very different thing that we see going on here. When you look at all registered voters, you get actually a more favorable environment for Donald Trump than if you look at those folks who are actually likely to turn out. And Again, vote. this is a flip from what we've seen historically. Are there any states this matters more than others? Yeah. So, you know, let's pause here for just a second. So again, when you're looking at national polling results, that doesn't really help us much when it comes to the presidential election, because you have to look at how they're polling in the swing states. At the end of the day, it comes down to those states that is going to determine who wins the election in November. And that's the area where Biden is not performing well. It's just a reality, right? So that's what you got to focus on. Remember, whenever you hear them talk about these uh, national polls, we always have to bring it back to the swing states because that is a big part of it. Now, let me come back here a little bit here and bring this back up. So I wanted to show you what he was talking about And here. if you look at those folks who are actually likely to turn out again, vote. this is a flip from what we've seen historically. Are there any states this matters more than others? Yeah, so, you know, 
We're looking nationally, but of course things are determined in the Electoral College. And one state where the polls have consistently shown, the New York Times, Siena College poll, I've also seen a little bit in our CNN poll when I dug into the cross tabs a little bit, where we see this massive jump from registered voters. Look at this, Donald Trump at 49%, Joe Biden at 42%. Go to likely voters, look at this, a well within the margin of error contest in which Joe Biden actually scores 47% to Donald Trump's 46%. He is doing significantly better among likely voters in Michigan than among registered voters. And part of the belief for that reason, John, is because Michigan has very lenient voter registration laws, a lot of automatic voter registration in the state of Michigan. So, that, that explains so let's pause here for a second. And this is what I want to point out, which they're not going to tell you because that's not their, it's not their job to tell you this. The fact that Joe Biden is only polling 1% above Donald Trump in Michigan and he's the incumbent, that's embarrassing. That is embarrassing. He won Michigan. Joe Biden won Michigan in 2020. It shouldn't even be that close. Now they're not gonna tell you that, otherwise they wouldn't be able to keep their jobs. But this is why the Democratic Party is freaked, this is why they're freaking out. Because th this, is, this is crazy, this is ridiculous. But you gotta remember what happened in Michigan, the uncommitted voter campaign that decided not to vote for Joe Biden in the primary. And a lot of them are still saying they're not gonna vote for him come November because of his actions towards the Palestinian people in Gaza. And you can't fault them for that. So there's that. And another thing I wanna point out, look at what they're focusing on. They're looking at the number of regis registered voters and the number of likely voters, right? So let's break this down, folks. These are the people who are registered right now. That number can always change. More people may register the closer we get to the election. We see this happen all the time. Like people are like, yeah, I'm not registered. I don't really care. And then the closer you get to November, people may change their mind and decide to register. We saw that happen in Georgia where Stacey Abrams actually got a lot of people that were not registered to register to come out and support Joe Biden. So we can't hold on to that number of registered voters just yet. Then when it comes to likely voters, they don't tell you what that is. Well, what do you mean likely? I mean, I could be likely to go to Dunkin' Donuts and get a green tea. Harmony Leaf, my fave. But I could also be likely to just make my own tea. I mean, what do you mean likely? Well, what do you mean? And what, what demographics are they using to determine, what data are they using to determine who is considered to be a likely voter? If it's just based on age, then maybe they're looking at voters 65 and up. But what are they looking at? We need to know that. Is Michigan overall what might be contributing to this trend? Yeah, so you know, we've spoken a ton about Joe Biden's problem with young voters, right? Look at the 2020 results. We see Joe Biden in those exit polls and in the post-election survey from the Pew Research Center, winning young voters, those under the age of 30, by 25 points. Right now in the polls, look at that. Joe Biden's up by just a single percentage point. My goodness gracious, what a decline for Joe Biden. But there is, of course, an age reversal going on here that I don't think gets spoken about nearly enough, which is in those exit polls in that Pew Research Center post-election survey, Donald Trump by five, now we have Joe Biden by six points. And of course, older Americans are much more likely to vote. So this is an age reversal I think Joe Biden will take. No, you yes, older, of, uh, older Americans are much more likely to vote. However, you have to remember that Joe Biden did get a significant portion of young voters in states like Georgia. And this is also why I think Georgia will go back to the Republican Party. I think Trump will win Georgia. Um, this is why I don't like calling it a swing state. I still think Georgia is a red state. But either way, it was those young voters that came out in Georgia that helped Joe Biden win Georgia, that along with the suburban moms, the Atlanta suburban moms. So there's that. So you can't just sit up here and discard those young voters that did come out. A lot of them first time voters that did come out to support Joe Biden. Look how quick he's just ready to just throw them away and just be like, well, there's a reversal here. There's a, a increase with the, the voters 65 and up. So those are the ones who are more likely to come out and vote. But what does that tell you?
The people who are 65 and up won't always be here. The younger people are the future. And if you're thinking about the future of this country, if you think about the way that our government has disappointed, has lied to the, the youth, the way that they've treated the youth, they've disregarded them, they've sick the police on the youth, the way that they have treated them. Do you think these kids are going to forget this when they get older? It's a different time. And we have social media. So they're going to remember that. These are things I think they're not thinking about. Well, these are the voters who show up, generally speaking, but that's a huge swing among yeah, it's, younger it, voters. It's something historic, John. All right, Harriet, and thank you very thank much. Thank you. Kate? Let's talk about this. Joining us right now is Republican Congressman Byron Donalds from Florida. Congressman, thanks for coming in. What Harry and John were talking about, you're also New York Times also had an analysis of this is kind of the registered voters versus the likely voters conundrum, I'm calling it. And as the New York Times kind of put it as part of their analysis, it says to an extent that hasn't been true in the New York Times Siena College polling in the last eight years, disengaged voters are driving the overall polling results and the storyline about the election. They they are the the disengaged are the low vote, low turnout voters. They're the voters that are less likely to actually decide to show up and vote on Election Day. With that in mind, how much does does that kind of this conundrum, if you will, concern you um, of regarding Donald Trump, his campaign efforts, him trying to win re-election, him trying to win uh, election once again with really kind of turning those voters out? Well, first of all, it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm obviously I'm not really too uh, concerned. Here's why: this election is really going to come down to a choice between two presidents, the 45th, the 46th. And I think that when you have a lot of voters registered, likely whatever the case might be, when they really take stock of the job both of these men have done, they're going to sit there and say Donald Trump was a significantly better president. It's not even close. Look at every metric. Look what's happening around the world. The world was safer. Uh, uh, inflation was lower. Our border was secure. Everything that truly matters in the lives of the American people was better under Donald Trump when he was president. So at the end of the day, I think that's what's going to really shake out at the only poll that matters on November 5th. One and this is the same thing I've been hearing from voters as well. And in particular, African-American voters, when we talk about the economy, and I'm going to show you one of the issues with under Joe Biden's economy in just a second, they're saying that like, look, I have more money in my pocket when Donald Trump was president. This is what I've heard from a lot of people. And he said the world was safer. Now, <laughs> let me go ahead and debunk something here. It's not like Donald Trump is anti-war because he's not. Donald Trump also implemented coups in Venezuela. He also sent money to Ukraine, not as much as the Biden administration, but he still sent money to Ukraine. But we didn't have the war in Gaza, or excuse me, Israel's assault on Gaza. We didn't have the war between Russia and Ukraine. And people are looking at those things and they're seeing every time you turn around millions of dollars and billions of dollars going out the door to Ukraine or to Israel. We weren't hearing about all this when Trump was president because we didn't have those particular conflict conflicts in play at that time. So one of the things that people do say is that Donald Trump didn't start any new wars. Right. But he did implement coups like the coup in Venezuela. There's that. There's also the issue with Julian Assange, which people seem to forget about this. You have to remember when was Julian Assange like kidnapped and all that stuff? That was under Trump's administration. So when a lot of people hear him say that he wants to free Julian Assange, you have to remember he had an opportunity to do that when he was president. It was his administration that went after him. So just think about that. But in reference to the, the economics, He's right about that. And now you'll see something else I'm going to show you, too, when it comes to the jobs. The thing we learned this morning is that the Biden campaign is going to be getting some help from three um, former police officers. Well, three police officers who were there on January 6th. Names that have become very uh, well known for speaking out about what happened to them on January 6th, how they defended the Capitol on January 6th. And the Biden campaign is going to be using them, getting help from them in swing states to, in their view, speak about the threat that Donald Trump poses to democracy in 2024. I mean, they, they carry an interesting story, an interesting personal story. How do you counter that? I counter that with the fact that that uh, Joe Biden has been a disastrous president and he has also he's been a threat to democracy. Check this out. He has suppressed the free speech of the American people during COVID-19. He forced members of our military to take the COVID-19 vaccine when they did not want to. And now that all the facts are out, they destroyed their military. Oh, let me move this up a little bit. 
Um, I think when it comes to the pandemic, there are some people that are upset about Trump, about his policies as well. Some people were not happy about the fact that Trump actually left it up to the governors of the states to decide whether or not they were going to implement lockdowns. Some people didn't like that. Who's a threat to democracy? It's without a question. Joe Biden has been that threat. Violations of separation of powers, violations of the First Amendment, just because he wanted to get his way. That is not good for an American president who just uses and, and changes the law based upon his own whim, his own desires, his own politics. That is wrong. And so I think if you're going to try to bring out what happened on January 6th versus the four years of Joe Biden's presidency, Joe Biden is the one who's not been protecting our institutions. He's not been protecting our constitution. He's actually been a major detriment to the very pillars of our nation. And this is part of the argument you were trying to make on the campaign trail for Donald Trump. Uh, Nikki Haley has now said she's going to vote for Donald Trump, which has some suggest. And then there goes into Nikki Haley. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm so tired of Nikki and I wish she would just fade away. But in reference to the economy, We'll show the young voter part uh, and then the economy. Look at this. Biden's problems with young voters are glaring. Poll finds. I'm just going to show you the numbers here. Younger voters have been a crucial voting block for Democrats for decades. Let me highlight this. Okay. Voters 18 to 29 years old made up roughly one in six voters in 2020. You see? So you can't sleep on the young people. They did help Biden. Biden won them by more than 20 points, according to the exit polls. He won voters under 45 who were 40% of the electorate by double digits too. But now when you look at the numbers in a head to head matchup with Trump, Biden and Trump are in a statistical tie with Biden narrowly ahead 50% to 48%. He leads he leads by just four points with voters under 45 and by six with Gen Z and millennials. Again, they're talking about national like voters, right? So this is the popular vote. This is not the electoral college. Remember, it comes down to the swing states. It could very much be that Biden could win the popular vote in November and still lose just like Hillary Clinton did. Let's go on. Now look at this part here. But when independence rfk jr cornell west as well as green party candidate jill steiner introduced biden trails trump by four points trump leads with six with gen z and millennials and by eight with those under 45 now let's get into the numbers of people who are younger right here joe biden's approval rating for voters 18 to 29 is just 24%. 24%. That's bad. 62% have an unfavorable opinion of him, while Trump gets a net positive rating, 49% to 42%. That's the highest favorability rating for Trump of any of the age groups. With voters overall, Trump has a slightly higher unfavorable rating, 54%, than Biden, 52%. So Joe Biden allowed Donald Trump to have a higher approval rating with the younger population than him. When it comes to the economy, this is one of the big issues that the Biden administration is lying about. Biden keeps telling you that he created all these jobs, but they never tell you what those jobs are. And I've complained about this for quite some time. Some of those jobs are just contract jobs. Some of those jobs are just temp positions. Yes, it does exist. I've done temp work. But they are silent about the layoffs. And I've been explaining this to people for over a year while they have been you know, bragging about the economy doing great. I've been trying to tell people that these companies have been laying people off by the hundreds. Most recently, right here in Massachusetts, Massachusetts largest life science employer to cut over 600 jobs. 
600 jobs. This was announced on May 28th. 600 jobs, folks. Life science is a big industry here in Massachusetts, particularly in the Boston area. It's not some one-off industry. A lot of the students that graduate from the colleges here end up working in life sciences. So it is popular. Now this industry is being hit. 600 people, this is just one of them. Just one. So this part right here, Let's see if I put it here. Doo, 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 doo. I can't remember if I put it here or if I had it on Twitter. I totally forget. Let me go to, I think it was here. If not, I'll have to go to my Twitter because they compared it to 2009. Doo, doo, doo. I'm probably going to have to go to my Twitter. Yeah, let me go to my Twitter. Sorry, guys. Um, Twitter. I want to show you something because I, it drives me crazy that they're not telling people this. And I feel like people are really being fooled and it really pisses me off, but you guys need to see this. Let's go to, uh, the tweet that I had about 2009. Let's find that. That wasn't too long ago. Cause I know Roger told me to send him the link. Ah, ha, ha. here it is. So I shared that and then pull this up. Where's the article savvy? Yeah, is this the one? No, but I, I have it here. I'll just show it here. This is what you need to see. It's this, I, I should have sent him the CNC, CNBC uh, article. Hold on. I wanna give you guys the article cause I don't like to, um, just show you that kind of stuff because I want you to be able to find the source. Um, oh, here it is. Okay. That way, if you want to look this up on your own and share this with other people, you'll have that source. So let me put that there. Yep. There it is. Okay. 2009. This is really scary. I, I want people to see this. And this is what pisses me off about the Biden administration because they've been lying to you guys about the jobs and they've been lying to you about the economy. Layoffs rise to the highest for any February since 2009. And we all know what happened in 2009. And it says it right here. Now, CNBC reported this. It says layoff announcements in February this year hit their highest level for the month since the global financial crisis. Since the global financial crisis. So while Joe Biden and Press Secretary Corinne, Corinne Pierre, while they are telling people that the job numbers are great, while they are telling people that the economy is doing great and they created all these jobs, they are totally omitting the layoff crisis that we have in this country. And this was recent. So this article was published February 21st of this year. When it comes to layoffs, they said this is the highest level since 2009 during the global crisis. This is a problem. And that doesn't mean that I like Donald Trump. That means that the Biden administration is lying to you about the job market. And I've been saying this over and over again. And here come the liberals. Oh, oh, she's some secret right winger. Oh, so you want Trump then? You want Trump then? No, I want our government to be held accountable. I want Joe Biden to tell you the damn truth about what's happening with the economy. We're back in 2009 global financial crisis numbers. And it's been out there. It's been out there. Let's talk about, he's talking about these jobs. Don't want to go into a tangent. Let's talk about all these jobs that are posted online that don't even exist. How many of you have applied for jobs online that don't even exist? They're fake positions. 
but they have to post them to show that they tried to at least hire someone. This has been going on for a long time. Meanwhile, these companies are doing quiet hiring where they've already given that position to someone that works there internally and they didn't give them an, a pay increase for it. They just gave them more damn work, but they had to post the position to show that they at least tried. I've been paying, I've been paying attention. I've done, I know cause I've done it. I've been the one applying for these jobs that don't even exist. Even internally, I've applied for jobs that don't exist. And then when you go talk to someone in the department and you ask them and say, I applied for the job, I was interested in a position. Oh yeah, that position don't even exist. They've already given that job to someone else. They just didn't change their title and they didn't give them a pay increase. So what are the jobs that Joe Biden created? I can't, I can't. So you see why the Dems are freaking out. 